Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. So what I'd like to do is show you how to graph exponential equations when we have multiple transformations. So in the last video, we just talked about equations that are in the form of y equals b to the x or y equals a times b to the x. And basically, we were just kind of showing you know, the different, the y-intercepts, the, the graphs, and basically just dealt with reflections, either reflection over the x-axis or reflection over the y-axis. But in, in general, just sketching the graphs, we didn't really get much change with the domain range. It was almost all the same uh, for every single problem. But now we're going to get into some transformations, which actually include some translations, meaning we're going to be shifting the graph up or down. Now we're still going to have, um, let's see, we're still going to have some reflections. You can see I have some negatives on the inside and the outside. And remember, when we multiply a function um, by a negative on the outside, that's going to be reflecting the x-axis, or reflecting the x-axis. And when we multiply by a negative inside the function, that's going to be reflecting the y-axis. Now, as far as translations go. Um, we basically are now adding an h and a k. Now it's very important, h and the k is kind of what we did for quadratics, same thing that we did for absolute value, radical expressions, whatever types of functions you've already um, witnessed. h is being um, subtracted inside the function and k is being added outside the function. Now it really doesn't matter subtract and adding because we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing both um, inside the functions. But remember, h is going to be a translation left or right and k is going to be a translation up or down. Or basically, we're going to be shifting the graph up or down based on the value of k. And we're going to be shifting the graph left or right based on the value of h. Last thing I want to remember is we go through this every single time. I don't want to spend a large amount of time explaining it, but it's usually one of the points where students get most mixed up, is remember it's x opposite of h. Okay, So you can always think about that as x minus h. Okay, So h is going to be your shifting left or right. But if it's x minus 3, well, that's really x minus 3. So therefore, h is equal to 3. That means I'm going to shift the graph three units to the right. And everybody gets confused because they think, oh, it's x minus 3. That's going 3 to the left. Well, actually, 3 is positive because the formula is x minus h. So therefore, it's going to be the opposite. Whereas if k is positive, you go up. If k is negative, you go down. But we do this for all the functions. I just thought I'd kind of rehash it again. Last thing I also want to just kind of go through with you is the parent graph. Because again, I don't have graph paper. Uh, the best way to really understand how graphs change based on the base. See, here's the base is 2. Here are the base is 4. Here are the base is uh, e. Here are the base is 1 half. All these different bases are going to affect the graph. I don't have graph paper. I'm not going to spend the time doing a perfect graph. I'm just going to sketch it. And all I ask for my students is to sketch it, as well as just provide one point. And the best point to provide is when you have, if you remember from our last video, the parent graph looks something like this when b is greater than 1. So the graph is always going to cross at, at a. If your equation is y equals b to the x, then the graph crosses at 0 comma b. Okay? And then remember, if b is less than 1, If b is less than 1, then the graph's going to look something like that. And also remember, we have this asymptote. So now that we're going to be doing, now that we have this horizontal asymptote, when we shift left or right, we're going to have to shift that asymptote. And that's very important because that's going to now affect our range of our graph. And I'll kind of explain it as we get into it. OK, so let's get into graphing. Oh, I didn't graph, I didn't produce um, a table for each one or not a table, but a, an x and y axis. So I'll just do that as we get to each one. OK, so the first thing what I like to do is always kind of sketch the parent graph kind of first, or the, the graph like we did last class period, or last video, where it's just a times b to the x. Then I like to apply the transformations. So in this case, forget about the minus 1. We just have 2 to the x, where I know my a is at 1. OK, so therefore, my graph is going to be crossing at 1. And it's going to look something like this. And I'm just going to use a dashed line um, to kind of represent my parent graph. OK, now the x minus 1, remember the formula is x minus h. So therefore, h is equal to 1. So since h is equal to 1, that means I'm taking this whole graph and shifting it to the right one unit. Well, if my one point that I had is at 0, 1, and if I shift that graph one unit to the right, now my new point is 1, 1. I don't know why I put a 0 there. Okay, So the whole graph is being shifted. If I'm just shifting the graph over, 
the asymptote is not going to move because that's a horizontal asymptote. So now my graph is just going to look something like this. All right? Um, next example, y equals 2 to the x. Parent graph is exactly the same, so I go to 1, graph that, okay? And I'll graph the asymptote in black as well because now I'm going to be changing the asymptote because when you look at this, now I'm here I was subtracting 1 inside the function, so that was my h, it shifts it left and right. Here I'm subtracting a 1 outside the function, so that's my k. Since k is negative, what that's doing is now I'm shifting the graph down one unit. So instead of the y-intercept being at 0, 1, the y-intercept is now at 0, 0. Instead of the asymptote being a horizontal line at 0, the asymptote is now a horizontal line at negative 1. Okay? So therefore, now I'm just kind of resketching the graph. It's going to look something like this. All right, now I got ahead of myself and I forgot to write the domain range. So let's go back and do that real quickly. This one you can see is just like all the graphs. If I'm shifting the graph left to right, the graph is still going to continue infinitely to the left and it's still going to continue infinitely to the right. So therefore, my domain is negative infinity to infinity. And my range, the graph doesn't go below 0 and it goes all the way up to infinity, so 0 to infinity. Now, as we look at this, now whenever you have a vertical translation, your domain and range are going to change. Uh, your range is now going to be affected by what that k is. So my domain is not affected. If I'm shifting the graph left to right, this graph is still going to go infinitely to the left and infinitely to the right. However, my range, since it's now being shifted, it, the lowest value my graph goes is now no longer 0. It's now negative 1, which was that k value. Okay. All right, let's get into the next example. So next example, I now have an a, and I have a plus 2. So again, Forget about the plus 2. Forget about the plus and minuses. Just graph the parent graph as we see it. So 1 fourth is my a, so that's going to be my y-intercept. And then 4 to the x is going to make some graph shoot up pretty quickly. Okay? And there's my asymptote. So now, actually, I uh, should do that in black. I just don't want to confuse. Okay, so there's the parent graph. Now, all we're doing is shifting the graph up two units. So instead of my y-intercept, instead of my y-intercept at 1 fourth, it's going to be 1 1 fourth, 2 1 fourth. Instead of my asymptote at 0, it's going to be shifted up to 1 2. Because when I subtracted 1, I went down 1. When I uh, add 2, I'm going to go up 2. So the graph's going to look something like that. The domain is not going to be affected. That's still negative infinity to infinity. However, my range is now going to be, now the lowest the graph goes is 2, and the highest it's going to go is infinity. All right, last one. Now we have two transformations. I'm now adding a 1 and adding a 2. So I'm adding the 2 again, but now I'm also adding the 1. Notice how my a in this case is 1, so I'm going to have y intercept of 1. But notice my base is 1 half. So rather than the graph increasing, since b is less than 1, the graph is now going to be decreasing. So let's sketch the parent graph. Forget about the 1 and the 2 first. So it's going to cross at 1. However, it's going to be decreasing. And right now, the asymptote is at 0. Okay? So that's just the parent graph right there. Now what I need to do is apply the transformations. So usually the plus 1 gets everybody. Um, remember the formula is x minus h. Well, we can write x plus 1 as x minus h if I just use a double negative, x minus a negative 1. So therefore, you can see that h is equal to a negative 1, because x minus a negative 1 is the same thing as x plus 1. So now that I'm minusing a 1, what we can see is the x plus 1 is actually shifting the graph to the left one unit. So instead of the intercept being at 0, 1, now this point is being moved over 1. And then I have the plus 2, which just like we did over here, is shifting that point up two more units, 1, 2. Okay. The best thing to do is move the asymptote before you resketch the graph. So the asymptote was originally at 0. That's being shifted up two units. And then I'm just going to resketch the graph. Okay. The domain is from negative infinity to infinity, again unchanged. And my range is now from 2 to infinity. So the shifting at left to right does not affect the range. It's only the shifting up or down. All right, now we have a negative or an x uh, reflection. Perfect. 
So I have uh, y equals negative 1 third x plus 2. Um, we know that my a is actually going to equal 1. We have b, which is 1 third, so it's going to be decreasing. Um, we have plus 2. Why am I adding 2 every single time? Let's add 1. I'm sick of this. I'm adding 2 every single problem. Now let's add 3. That'll be fun. Let's do 3. OK. Oh, I subtract 3 right there anyways. All right, let's add 1. <laughs> Sorry, I did 2 twice. And I'm like, I don't want to do 2 twice. Add, subtract, subtract. OK, that's fine. Um, so we have, so let's sketch the graph. Again, forget about the plus 1. Now, we know that the negative is a, so that's negative 1. So instead of my graph crossing at 1, I'm, neg I'm reflecting that over the x-axis because I'm multiplying by a negative outside. So now my y-intercept is going to be at negative 1. Um, actually, you know, let's sketch this without. Forget about the negative for a second. If we just graph 1 third x, the graph crosses at 1, and the 1 third makes it decrease like this, right? So if I flip this over, basically reflect it, it's now crossing at negative 1, and now the graph looks something like that. Okay, now notice with that graph, the asymptote is still at 0, 0, or not 0, 0, but at y equals 0. And now I'm basically just shifting this graph up one. So now my new y-intercept is at 0, 0. My new asymptote is at y equals 1. And the graph looks like this. Now that my domain is from negative infinity to infinity, whereas my range is now not going, now it, does, it has a ceiling how far how high it can go. The lowest it could go was always 0 for all of the, well, for these two problems. But now, it can go infinitely down, so my range is negative infinity, and how high it can go is to 1. Matt, is the lowest, is the graph at the bottom? Okay, next example, y equals e. Remember, e represents an irrational number, approximately 2.71, dot, 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 dot. Um, so therefore, as far as the... You know, that's just going to affect kind of you know, this, how fast the graph is increasing, which is going to be between 2 and 3, which, again, I'm just approximating because I don't have graph paper. Um, and that's not the point. I want you to understand the transformations and what the graph looks like and how to apply the transformations. So let's look at the transformations here. The transformations here, I have minus 2 and minus 3. Um, just like we talked about here, the minus 2 is going to be shifting the graph to the right two units. The minus 3 is going to be shifting the graph down three units. Um, notice my a is equal to 1. So my y in or so my parent graph is going to look something like this with an asymptote at 0, at y equals 0. Then all I'm going to do is shift. So my one point I have that I know is as at 0, 1, because that was my a. That was part of my parent graph. So all I'm going to do is move that point two units to the right, and then three units down. So 1, 2, 3. Now, the important thing is we also have to move this asymptote. The asymptote is at y equals 0. That is now getting shifted down three units. OK, and now I can just resketch my graph. OK, domain. Domain is going to be from negative infinity to infinity. The range, though, is before, for the parent graph, with no transformation, the graph could only go as low as 0. Since I shifted the graph down three units, now the graph can only go as low as negative 3. But as you notice, both of these graphs are increasing without bound. So therefore, the um, second form of the range is going to be infinity. <sighs> OK. Uh, next example can confuse a lot of students. And it's usually kind of one of the more typical ones that uh, confuse them. But I think once you get into trigonometric functions, this is kind of helpful. One of the best things I like to do whenever you have a, a negative inside of your function. Oh, whoa, whoa. Oh. No. Dang it, did I do that? Negative 1, yeah, plus 1. OK, I did that fine. Um, the one thing, I didn't add this into there. Just make sure you're following the order of operations. Don't take this graph, add 1, and then reflect. Remember, the order of operations, you're going to do multiplication before adding and subtracting. So make sure you reflect first and then add. That's why it's really, really important to do that. Because if you would have added 1, if you would have done the transformations and then done the reflections, this graph would look totally different. So I forgot to remind you about that. You can see, when you're doing these, make sure you, that's really important to follow the steps that I did. Graph the graph as it is with no translations, then apply the translations. 
It's going to be the exact same thing in this case. Um, one of the things, another way to kind of look at this is to rewrite this as factoring out the negative. And I hope you agree with me that negative times x minus 3 is the exact same thing as a negative x plus 3. But what's important about this, what I like about looking in this question is we're multiplying, still multiplying by a negative on the inside of the function. That means we're reflecting about the y-axis. But in reality, it's a minus 3, which is actually shifting the graph to the right 3. Because that negative x is actually multiplying the whole inside function by a negative. So by factoring out that negative, we can see the transformation is actually 3 units to the right, not 3 units to the left. Um, and you can, you can double check that. You can plug it into your calculator and kind of verify that, or create a table and do the same thing. Um, in this case, though, we see that my a is going to be 2. So therefore, I'm going to cross at 2. I still have a y-intercept. Okay, and the graph looks something like that. Now, that negative is going to tell me to reflect. So now the graph is going to be reflected, right, about the y-axis. And then the minus 3 is telling me to shift 3 units to the right. Where did I do that? Yep, minus 3 is shifting it to the right. So I'm going to go over 1, 2, 3 units to the right. Now, notice that since I didn't go up or down, my asymptote remains the same. Okay, but now my new point is at 3 comma 1, and I can just kind of sketch the same graph approaching the asymptote. My domain is from negative infinity to infinity. My range, the graph does not go below 0, and it goes as high as infinity. And there you go. All right, last but not least, uh, negative 3 e to the x minus 3. So in this case, again, e to the x, or negative 3 e to the x, Let's forget about the negative as well as the minus 3 for a second. Let's just go 3 to the e to the x. 1, 2, 3. a is 3, so therefore it's going to go up 3. It's going to look something like this. Negative is on the outside, so that's reflecting over the x-axis. 1, 2, 3. Asymptote is at 0. The x minus 3 is going to shift the graph 3 units to the right. So instead of having a y-intercept at 0, negative 3, which was known by this negative 3, I'm going to shift it to the right 3. 1, 2, 3. And then I'll just resketch my graph. And the asymptote never changed because I never went up or down. So I never had a vertical translation, so I never had to change the asymptote. Uh, the domain is, again, from negative infinity to infinity. The range, now the graph goes infinitely down, so that goes to 0. And it goes all the way up to, oops, sorry. The range goes all the way down to negative infinity all the way up to 0. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is how you sketch uh, exponential functions when you have uh, vertical and horizontal translations. Thanks.